Well, I hope that that chapel bumper video gives you just a taste of what our chapel series will look like this semester. Shout out to Chase McGlamory for making that for us this semester. I'm Brielle Davis, the Director of Campus Activities and Interim Campus Minister here at Milligan, and it is an honor and it is a joy to get to be here with you all today. Will you pray with me? God, thank you for the opportunity to gather here today. I pray over this chapel service and that it would be glorifying and honoring to you as I believe it has already. May you prepare our hearts and our minds as we wrestle with the role that questions play in the Bible, in the life of Jesus, and in the lives of us. We give this time to you. Use it for your kingdom and for your glory. And in Jesus' name, amen. When I was a kid, I always wanted to sit near the adults' table. I desperately longed to hear what they were talking about and ask them questions. It didn't really matter what they were talking about. I was just unlikely to know what they were talking about, and I wanted to gain knowledge of what it was. And then in school, and in various internships and jobs, I am always asking questions. It could be about a certain assignment, it could be a about a paper or a specific task, but in these cases, I ask questions with the intention of gaining a greater understanding and clarification. And then I am also that coworker and that friend and that family member who is always asking questions. Ask Tony or Chase or Rich or Nicole or Emma. Not a day goes by that I'm not asking some sort of question about their lives or their personalities. My intention with these types of questions, though, is simply to create a deeper understanding and a deeper relationship with them and understanding of who they are. But I don't believe that questions simply play a large role in my life, so I want to hear from you guys. Um, I'll take a few people, if you're willing to speak up. What is one of the favorite questions you've ever been asked? I'll even let you shout it out. All right, I'll give you a few examples. Uh, I knew it was gonna, it, it could go either way with you guys. Um, but maybe one is, will you marry me? Maybe, I know. Maybe one is, do you wanna build a snowman? Do you wanna go get coffee with me? One of my personal favorites that I hear a lot around this time of year is, when is Wonderful Wednesday? And then one that I'm sure will become one of my favorites is, is there chapel today? But whether or not we realize it, questions are a large part of our lives. They're one of the key ways that we learn, that we engage with one another, how we build relationships, and how we gain a deeper understanding of things. And not only do questions play a large role in our lives, but all throughout the biblical narrative and in the life and the ministry of Jesus. Now the majority of questions we'll address this semester through our chapel series are questions that Jesus asked others. This is for no other particular reason, except for these are the questions that a lot of our speakers had laid on their hearts. But for the purpose of today, we're going to tackle three questions that people ask Jesus. And as I've already mentioned, people ask questions with a lot of different motives. To gain knowledge, to build relationships, to increase clarity. And in the Bible, Jesus both used and he welcomed questions. Sometimes, questions asked were meant to achieve a purpose we've already mentioned, but sometimes questions were also used coming from a place of doubt, to challenge, or to provoke. Above all of these specific reasons for questions, though, questions seek to get at truth, either to find the truth, to highlight it, or to make another person consider or acknowledge a truth. Questions seek to get at a truth. So I'm going to invite Julie up, and she's going to jump into our first instance where someone asked Jesus a question by reading a scripture passage for us. This is John 9, 1 through 11, and it says, As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. 
Go, he told the hen, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home singing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that it was. Others said, no, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. How then were your eyes open, they asked. He replied, the man they called Jesus made some mud and put it on my eyes. He told me to go to Siloam and wash. So I went and washed, and then I could see. So John 9 opens with a man, or opens with Jesus passing by a man who has been blind his entire life. The disciples react in to the situation with the typical worldview of the era. In their minds, suffering um, is typically a punishment for something. So they ask Jesus whose sin this man is suffering for, his own or that of his parents. And Jesus responds with, neither this man nor his parents sinned, for he was born blind so that God's works might be revealed in him. So first, Jesus shows that their assumption is wrong. Neither this man nor his parents had done any specific sin leading to his blindness. And it doesn't mean that they had never sinned, but that the blindness was not a direct result of any sin. Wrong assumptions will lead to wrong conclusions. And knowing that a wrong assumption was there brings about the larger importance of the disciples asking this question. In Jesus' response, it shows the importance of the disciples' question should be pointed away from why the man is blind and pointed more towards what God can do in this. This instance gets at a truth that opens up an opportunity to thinking about how God works in and through us. By the disciples asking this question, it allowed their assumption to be debunked and brought them into a new, deeper understanding of God's work in their lives and all around them. I'm going to invite Bryant up. He's going to lead us into our second instance where someone asked Jesus a question. Luke 10, 21 through 28. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father, and no one knows who the Father is except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Then he turned to his disciples and said privately, Blessed are the eyes that see what you see, for I tell you that many prophets and kings wanted to see what you see, but did not see, and to hear what you hear, but did not hear it. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is it written in the law, he replied. How do you read it? He answered, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. So it's a common discussion regarding the intention of the expert in the law in this passage. The version that Bryant just read um, said that he was trying to test Jesus. Was he trying to challenge him? Was he simply just being inquisitive? From the earlier verses in the passage um, and from the parable of the Good Samaritan that follows, it seems as if there is more to the expert of the law's motive rather than simply being curious. But we won't go too deep into that today because no matter the man's intention, the importance of this question remains the same. The expert of the law asks, what must I do to inherit eternal life, verse 25. The question is one of the most important questions to be asked, but Jesus has already given us the answer. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. So sometimes questions are not ones that provide us with new information, but remind us how to live. By coming to God with our questions, it allows us the opportunity to then be further prompted or remind us how to live a life that glorifies him, that points to life. Joy, I'm going to have you come on up, and she's going to read a third instance where someone asked Jesus a question. Uh, okay, so I'm going to read John 4, 1 through 15. Now Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that he was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John, although in fact it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. So he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now he had to go through Samaria, so he came to a town in Samaria called Sakar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. 
Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew, and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drank from it himself, as did also his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. So Jesus meets the Samaritan woman at Jacob's well after a morning's journey and disregards social custom by asking her for a drink. As the passage states, Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. And we won't get too deep into this passage um, because I believe someone else intends to speak on this um, a little bit more depth later in the semester. But as a Samaritan, the woman reveres this place of Jacob's well, but is also curious about the stranger who promises something greater. She has a good grasp on her own traditions, beliefs, and traditions, yet she is eager for eternal abundance that this Jesus promises. So let's recall some of the questions that the Samaritan woman asks in this portion of their conversation. Verse 9, how is it that you, a Jew, ask a drink of me, a woman of Samaria? Verse 11, sir, you have no bucket and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? And verse 12, are you greater than our ancestor Jacob who gave us the well and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? The Samaritan woman listens with open attentiveness to Jesus as she asks him questions about faith and hope. And the longer she talks with him, the more her understanding grows until she sees the full truth. The kind that, as verse 14 says, will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And as a result of her questioning, later on in the passage, she returns to her town and effectively shares of her own experience with Jesus, inviting the villagers to come and see if they reach the same conclusion about him. Verse 39 says, many Samaritans from that city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. So her actions invite us to stay connected to Jesus and to ask questions about our faith in order to come to a fuller understanding of it. She asked questions that seek to get at a truth, and as a result, her faith becomes deeper. The questions that punctuate the Bible are rich, and they are relevant. They are everywhere and they are powerful. Questions asked both to and from Jesus throughout his ministry are used to enter more fully into the lives of others, to help people look at the state of their hearts, to draw them into a deeper faith and understanding, and ultimately, to get out of truth. Jesus used any welcomed questions as a means of both connection and transformation. As a way of showing people the work of God in and around them, Reminding and challenging them about how we then should live by loving our God and our neighbor. And by showing them the living water. So if you came here today and you are unsure of the role that questions should be in your life, especially in relation to your faith, please know that it is okay and it is natural to have questions. Questioning and faith do not have to be opposed to one another. Just as we use questions in our everyday lives, God invites us to use them as a way to draw nearer to him so that we might open up more fully to God and to his purposes in and for us. Jesus loved questions, and we should too. So this is my challenge to us and encouragement to us this semester as we go further into this series. May we be okay with being uncomfortable with asking questions. Let us allow our own assumptions to be debunked and brought into a new, deeper understanding of who God is and how he can work in our lives and in the world around us. Let us allow ourselves to be humbled enough to ask and be reminded by the promises of scripture and the basis of how we then should live. And let us strive to stay connected to Jesus and ask questions about our faith in order to come to a fuller understanding of it. 
And by doing this, I believe that we can discover truth in strange and wonderful ways together. So let's pray. God, thank you again for this time together. I pray that you would continue to work on our hearts and on our minds, and we wrestle with the concept of questions this semester, and the importance of the various questions that Jesus used and welcomed in the Bible. May we leave today in confidence that questions asked can be a gift to our relationship with you and others if we let you work on us through them, so that our relationship with you and the world around us emerge stronger and more steadfast. And in Jesus' name, amen. You may go in peace.